and giving. Okay? Some of them too many times. Okay? If you know what I mean. And, and so I started tithing in my life, but I still wasn't experiencing what I really wanted to experience. See, I expected that if I tithed, that just automatically I'd get blessed. And, and here's what happened. I got blessed based upon how good of a steward I was with what I was blessed with. Don't shout me down, okay? And, and, and God began to teach me some things that, that you see, the Bible, the Bible says, number one, it says, study to show yourself approved. The Bible also says that if you're faithful over the small things, he'll make you ruler over much. He didn't say, I'll make you ruler over much first. And that's a message that we need to send out to the younger generation All of these folks that are getting right out of high school thinking they need to take the companies over that day. Okay. Um, God said, um, you see, God does miracles. We all know that. We've all experienced miracles in our life. Amen. Say amen if you've experienced a miracle. Okay. God definitely does miracles. We know that. And, And our God does not change. So he's still in the miracle business. But typically, the way that God does things is in steps. That's the reason that it's important for us to learn how to operate and to take steps of faith in our life. Because as we do that, we grow in our faith and we grow in the areas that God is is teaching us. And so I learned a long time ago that concerning my finances that there were some things that I had to do. It it wasn't just about tithes and offerings and seed offerings and almsgiving. It wasn't just about that. There were things that, that I had to do. Myra taught about a lot of those things yesterday. You see, if and, and I'm not I'm not coming down on Starbucks. But if you're buying three cups of Starbucks coffee a day for $147 a cup, by the time you put all your mixtures in there, and, and you know, I hear some people, I, I don't, if, if I go to Starbucks, it's for my wife or Michael. And, and, um, and, and, and so... You, you stand at the counter as they're ordering, and sometimes you would swear they're speaking in tongues. You know, because, it, it, I mean, their orders are this long, or Greek or Hebrew, I don't know. But anyway, and, and so it's important that, you know, we get an understanding. If you're spending $15 a day on Starbucks, or you're spending $15 a day on tobacco, or $15 a day on anything... You need to understand that there, there, that could be the problem as to why that you're not having any money at the end of the month. Amen or oh me? You know, and, and, and oh me. Yeah, you know, and, and so it's important that we learn how to, this used to be a phrase that, was, that we taught our kids concerning drugs years ago, just say no, Okay. And, and then we quit telling our kids no, and then they quit saying no. And so then we get ourselves in a big mess because, you know, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And we're saying all the right things, and we're tithing, and we're giving, and we're doing those things. But we have a responsibility to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with. You know, and and then... That's why we brought Myra in here to talk about some of the natural things concerning finances, and uh, and she's she's good. She she's not good. She is great. Um, We've known her and Rick for a long time, and um, Rick was a police officer. Myra was a hairdresser, 
and, um, and, and hairdressers make a lot of money. We got some of them in here, you know, and God's blessed them. And, and police officers don't make a lot of money. I know. And, and so, but they made up their mind that they didn't want to live like that, almost in poverty all of their life. And when they pulled up to the gas pump, they had to count pennies so they could put $20 worth of gas in their car. So they made some changes. And that's what she talks about. She wrote a book about it. And, uh, and now they are multi, multi, multi millionaires. And it all started out by just making some changes. And then they started buying real estate. And God truly, truly blessed them. And, and now they own, I don't know how many businesses. And, uh, and they just live a life of doing whatever they want to do. You know, and they're not even 60 yet. They're young. Really, really, really young. Real young. And so... I want our church, she said yesterday, she said, uh, she had everybody say this, I'm a millionaire, okay? And so um, I thought, I like that as a pastor. I like the idea of having a hundred millionaires in our church, <laughs> you know, and, and, and to see how that God blesses. Now, now listen to me. If you're new here, or this is your first time, we don't talk about money around here a whole lot. Um, typically, every Sunday, what you just saw on the screen is what you get concerning our, our finances. Um, I learned a long time ago that I don't, uh, please don't take this personal, but I don't have to depend on you for the finances of this church. Um, I depend on my God. And God has never let us down. And, you know, we started this church. We didn't have some big church backing us. We didn't have a denomination backing us. We didn't have any of that stuff. And God provided. And he provided. And, and, and it was amazing to see all that God has done over the years. And, you know, I, I, I'll give you a for instance. We've always had... A buffer in our checking account at the church here at the church and um, and in the beginning that buffer was ten dollars <laughs> if we had ten dollars we were happy because we didn't have any hot checks because I don't do hot checks and and then it got to where that it was a thousand dollars and then it was you know um, $1,500, and I, I can remember that there was a time and we were praying, God, just, just give us a $3,000 buffer. You know, just, just give us that $3,000 buffer. And he did. And so every time that we have prayed that, God has blessed us, and God has done that. So somebody said, well, why don't you just pray for a million-dollar buffer? Because that's not the way God works. Amen. He does things in steps. If we needed a million dollar buffer, we would have it. And we would have it right now because God would lay it on somebody's heart to give us a million dollars. And so I have total and complete faith and confidence in my God to provide for me as a pastor and to provide for this church, but also to provide for me and my family, me and my wife. And, and he has always done that. And so... It's very, very important to me that everybody within the sound of my voice experiences that same favor with God that I have. God is no respecter of persons. And there's things that, you know, the Bible says that if any man lacks wisdom and knowledge, just ask. I thought it was amazing that Myra yesterday, she said this. She said, I'm going to give all of you my phone number. And you can call me any time that you want to if you have any questions concerning finances. And she, she told us, she said, you know, she said, typically out of 100 people, she said, I'll be surprised if more than one actually calls me. 
So what does, what does that say? It, it, it says that we're not really following through with what the Word of God says to do. If you have questions, you need to ask. You know, now, now listen to me. If everybody that you know is poor, don't go ask them for advice on your finances. Are, are you listening to me? You don't ask a bicycle mechanic for advice on your car mechanics. And you don't do the same thing with your finances. If you have questions, you go to someone who has proven themselves and that is blessed in that area. And listen to what they're saying. And, and then apply those principles to your life. And as you do that, God will bless it. Now, listen to this in 3 John 2. This is kind of our foundation scriptures for this series. 3 John 2 says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. That's the heart of our God. God wants you to be blessed in every area of your life. There used to be a teaching back in the olden days. I know Bob's watching. He's not here because Annette had knee surgery. But I know Bob's watching. So when I refer to the olden days, I'm talking about when Bob was young. Okay? <laughs> many, many, many years ago. And, and, but there was a teaching back in that day that in order to be godly, you had to be poor. And, and that's just not, that's not biblical. God wants you blessed. If he didn't want you blessed, he wouldn't have talked so much about how to get blessed. You see, there's more in the Bible about giving than there is love or hell or heaven combined. Because God wants you blessed. God wants you to have the very, very best in life. And so, so here's what people do. They say, well, that's just not for me. My daddy was poor. His daddy was poor. His daddy was poor. Everybody in my family has been poor. I'm just going to be poor. Well, the Bible says that you can have what you say. If you want to be poor, you just keep saying that. You know, same thing with your health. I'm sitting here right, I'm, I'm not sitting here, I'm standing here right now, and, and, and I'm looking at Jill Pippin sitting right there. I heard a testimony this week. Do you know, she couldn't eat a few months ago. She got down to, I'm not going to tell you how little she got. She got skinny, skinny, skinny. Okay? She literally looked like death walking around. And she trusted God, and God has healed her. You know? She called Rhonda on Friday to ask her, and, and when, when I heard this, I got all excited. She said, is it okay if I bring food to the class on Saturday because I can't go three hours without eating. I said, praise God. You know, now stand up, Jill. I want, I want, look how good she looks. I mean, she looks amazing. Yeah. And she's single, by the way. But anyway. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so... Are you doing that with your finances? Are you just accepting where you're at? Or are you being all that God has in store for you financially? You know, uh, Myra said something yesterday, and, and, and when she said it, I just shook my head, yes, in agreement. I've been poor, and when I say poor, I'm talking about, you know, I, I was one of those persons that... that Man, I didn't know how I was going to make it. And I didn't know how I was going to buy gas. And I didn't know how I was going to uh, pay my truck payment. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this because I'm just real and I'm open with everybody. When I was young, I had a truck that got repossessed because I couldn't pay for it. Because I was stupid and I had no, and I said that stupid right here in church because that's what I was. I didn't ask anybody and that's back when you could go buy a new pickup and it didn't matter what your credit looked like. It didn't matter how old you were. You just signed on the line and you drove off in that new pickup with 21% interest rates. 
And your truck payment was more expense, more money than what you made every two weeks. But you look good for about six months. And I learned a valuable lesson. If you don't pay for it, they come and get it in the middle of the night. And then you're back to the bicycle. And, and, and so I've been poor. I know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck and hoping that a check comes in the mail. And, and I've been there. I have been there. And probably everybody within the sound of my voice has been there. Praise God, I'm not there anymore. Okay? And I thank God that I'm where I'm at now as opposed to where I used to be. But it took two things. It took me doing what the Word of God said to do and getting some wisdom and knowledge in finances. And I had to learn. I had to learn about investments and I had to learn about interest rates and I had to learn about paying bills. And, uh, and, and, and so I read books and I talked to people. And uh, there was a man in our church that when I was growing up, and, and he was, this guy was so rich that, I mean, in the, in the dictionary where it says rich, it had his picture. He was rich, rich. And he really liked me when I was, well, he still really likes me. And, uh, and he kind of took me under his wing, and he taught me a lot of things about finances. And because of that, it turned everything around for me. And so... I want to share those things with you. We talked about tithing and the importance of tithing. You know, actually what you're doing when you're tithing, we talked about this last week, is is you're not giving God your tithes. You're not paying your tithes. Let me rephrase it. You're not paying anything. You're just giving back to God the 10% of what he gave you. And here's what he asked. He said, you give me 10% and I'll bless you. That's what he said. So you give him 10%, God will bless you. And so, so that's, that was uh, basically the first thing in the series that we talked about was tithing and how important it is that we tithe, that we, we give 10% of our first fruits. I'm going to talk about first fruits today in detail because I think we have a misunderstanding of that. And so... Um, and so as we tithe, as we give, the Bible tells us this. It tells us that, that in, in several different scriptures, especially in the New Testament, that as we give, it'll be given back to us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Okay. It also says, also says that if we give, the windows of heaven will be opened, and blessings will be poured upon us that we can't even contain. Okay. It also says all throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... That, that as we give, especially in first fruits, that it'll be given back to us some 20, some 30, some 60, some, depending on the translation that you read, some 90, some 100 fold. Okay? I found out something this past week that I thought was very, very interesting concerning first fruits uh, offerings is that, that we get back 100 fold. Okay? Now that doesn't mean, and this is what I found very interesting, it doesn't mean a hundred times what you gave. If you go back and you actually study hundredfold out in the Hebrew, okay, in the Old Testament, now keep in mind that when Jesus talked in the New Testament, he was, Jesus was a Jew. You all know that, right? Okay, and he was talking to Jewish people. And because of that, he spoke to them in Jewish terms. And a lot of times that that translation gets twisted in different versions of the Bible. But if you go back and you and you you study out hundredfold, this is is um, what it means. Infinity. Infinity. 
It doesn't mean a hundred times. It means that when you give, that God is going to bless you back infinity. He's going to bless you. And, and, and in, in one translation, it says in, in the Hebrew, it actually, it's got, it's got a group of words that's about this long that I can't say. But, but what it means in English is that he will establish a relationship with you that is much like marriage that gives infinity. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? And, and so as we give the first fruits, then what that does is it opens up. Man, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps up here. It opens up the windows of heaven in a way that we, have, we, we don't really think about. You know, and, 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 and so in, hey, I'm really sorry. Just forget the notes. I, because I'm, I'm, I'm just going with my heart this morning. And, and so, I, matter of fact, I want you to turn with me over to Malachi. I want to show you something. This is, this is going to help us. Malachi chapter 3, starting in, uh, let's see, let me get my glasses here. I'm going to be reading out of the message translation, actually. It says, but who will be able to stand up to that coming? Now, that coming that he's talking about, there that Mal- Let me go back and give you a little history on Malachi. Malachi, there's no history on Malachi as a person, okay? There, there's, there's no history that tells us where he was born, whose kid he was, uh, how long he lived, anything. There, there's no history on Malachi. But what Malachi means in the Hebrew is message from God, okay? And, and, and so... You know, back in those days, you gave kids a name that meant something. And so his name, Malachi, meant a message from God. And so here's what he said, But who will be able to stand up to that coming? Who can survive his appearance? He'll be like the white, hot fire from the smelter's furnace. He'll be like the strongest lye soap at the laundry. He'll take his place as a refiner of silver, as a cleaner of dirty clothes. He'll scrub the Levite priest clean, refine them like gold and silver, and they are fit for God, fit to present offerings of righteousness. Then and only then will Judah and Jerusalem be fit and pleasing to God as they used to be in the years long ago. Okay. Let, let me stop right there. I want to explain something to you. And, 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 and we'll touch on what I'm fixing to explain to you a little bit more. Used to, when, when there was a, a, a time to bring offerings, okay, and they would bring the offering to the temple. But there was a requirement when they were bringing an offering, if, if it was a lamb or if it was a calf or if it, regardless of what it was, when they came with the offering, now this is an Old Testament, when they came with the offering, they had to bring half a shekel with them to present that with the offering. A half a shekel is, is a piece of silver, okay? It's like we use money today, but they had to bring half a shekel to be able to present their offering. You had to give to be able to give. Now, now keep that in mind. And so, so I want you, to, as I'm explaining this, I want you to think of the modern day church along with this. So, so here's what was happening at the temples. Okay, those that were responsible for the money, for taking the money, which they were probably deacons, that's a joke, okay, Um, and the priest that were responsible, here's what they were doing. You could only get the shekels in Jerusalem, okay, and so here's what was happening 
is they were going before the feast. Are you ready for this? And they were buying up all the shekels. Okay? They're buying up all the shekels. It's kind of like if, if you wanted to go to a concert or to the Super Bowl, and the day that the tickets came out, somebody went online and bought them all up for the price that they sold for, say, $100. And then they would turn around and sell them for twenty dollars or $30,000. But what was happening is that the priest and the money changers, they were going buying up all the shekels, and then they would sell the shekels back to the people so that they could give an offering. So they were making all this money off of them. So the people, get this, the fine, fine, godly people, were sick and tired of being ripped off at the temple, so they quit going. Does that sound familiar? But it gets better than that. Because the, the shekel was a piece of silver, the good godly people that were giving the shekels, this is what they were doing. They were shaving them. Yeah. They'd, they'd take a little off for them, a little off for God. Right? They're just shaving it off. And then they would, they would save it over here because it was silver. That's part of the reason that when the United States started minting coins, if you'll remember, there used to be a band all the way around the edge of it. That's back when our money was worth something and it was made out of copper and gold and silver. Okay, it, It's not made out of that anymore, so they don't have to band it. So what would happen was, is that the good godly people, they were ripping off the temple and the temple was ripping off them. Are, are you hearing me? So that's why you read on down, it says, I'm God. Yes, I am. I haven't changed. Okay? God hasn't changed. Maybe you didn't hear me. He has not changed. He said in the Old Testament, I have not changed. So that, that means this. So when you say, and, and this just, it, it just blows my mind when people say this because it tells me they don't read the Bible is they say, well, the Bible doesn't teach anything about tithing in the New Testament and we're under the New Covenant. Okay, dummy, be broke. Okay? I am God. I do not change. The same promises and the same things that happened in the Old Testament are the same promises we get in the New Testament. And it belongs to us. I am God. Yes, I am. I haven't changed. And because I haven't changed, you, the descendants of Jacob, haven't been destroyed. You have a long history of ignoring my commands. You haven't done a thing I've told you. Return to me so I can return to you, says God of the angel armies. You ask, but how do we return? Begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? See, now, now does that make sense after you hear the history of what was happening with the shekels? He's saying, do, do they rob God? But you rob me day after day. You ask, how have we robbed you? The tithe and the offering, that's how. And now you're under a curse the whole lot of you, because you're robbing me. Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury so there will be ample provisions in my temple. Let me in this, test me in this, and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. That's part of that hundredfold blessing. For my part, I will defend you against marauders, protect your wheat fields and vegetable gardens against plunderers. The message of God of the angel armies, look, I'm sending my messenger on ahead to clear the way for me. Suddenly, out of the blue, the leader you've been looking for will enter the temple. Yes, 
the messenger of the covenant, Jesus. The one you've been waiting for, look, he's on his way. A message from the mouth of God of the angel of armies. Yes, I'm on my way to visit you with judgment. I'll present compelling evidence against sorcerers, adulterers, liars, and those who exploit workers. These were the priests that were doing this. L- listen, did you, let, let me tell you a, a, a funny thing, not a funny thing, something about sorcerers. Because when we think of sorcerers, we think of magic, right? Actually, that word sorcerers, the, the root word of sorcerers, are you ready for this? Is pharmaceutical. So he was talking to the drug dealers in the Old Testament that were providing hallucinogens to those that were involved in all of these other things, liars, those who exploit workers. We're talking about priests who take advantage of widows and orphans who are inhospitable to the homeless. Anyone and everyone who doesn't honor me message from God of the angel armies. You'll be voted happiest nation. You'll experience what it's like to be a country of grace. God of the angel armies says so. So what God say in this passage of scripture, he, one of the things that he said is try me in this. See if I won't pour out blessings upon you that you can't even contain. That's God. My, my favorite part of that scripture that I stand on all the time is that, and, and he says this in, in other translations other than, and it means the same other than, than the message, is that he will devour for my sakes. Okay? And, and, and this is what I've noticed, that since I've been obedient to do what God has told me to do with my cars, my cars don't burn. My, my, my things in my home and, and, and things in, in my life are protected by God. And, and when he's rebuking the devourer for your sakes, then there are things that would to you because he's already rebuked the devourer. Last week I got home one night wife is there and she says it's in this house and uh, and she was right and she said I love you gotta go so that meant you need to fix this so I'm walking around I'm thinking well you know is, is it the washing machine is it the toilets? I'm making sure that everything's not stopped up, and nothing was stopped up. And and um, and I thought, man, this smells horrible. And so we have a station in our backyard that moves the stuff. Okay, we'll just say, okay, it city sewer line. And I walked out in the backyard, and the stuff was floating yard okay and I, I, I have a lot of experience dealing with these lift stations but I, I have a that does and so I called him and I said I said uh, what, what can I check and he told me what to check told me what to do and I did that and it still wasn't working and um, next thing I, the, I I'm, I'm telling this is a funny story, but I'm telling you this is this is a this is how my God works. It just so happens that one of the businesses he owns is a septic business. And next thing I know, him and his son up and. And they fixed station. And 
and fixed it better than it was, put a pump in it, did, did all of this. And, and, I, and as they left, you know, that's just the way that God is. You know, even when the enemy attacks us, God always takes it. He turns it around better. Always. And so it was, we a better stuff mover. Okay? Than we did have. And, and um, you know, I'm not going to tell you that it was Brian Turner because I don't want y'all calling him to come fix your septic. But, but he, you know, it was just amazing how that God works through those things. And, and, and listen to me. When we are obedient to God to do what he tells us to do and to put him first in every area of our life, especially including our finances, then listen to me. There's a favor that comes with God and with man. And blessings come from. And I can give testimony after testimony after testimony. And so, um, about how that God has done that in my life so many times. And, and so tonight we're going to have a banquet. We do this every year. We're going to have free food. But it's not really free. You paid for it. You give to the church. Church is paying for it. And, and, but we're going to have a good meal, and we're going to come in here, and we're going to fellowship, and we're going to give you some, some of our vision for this next year and the things that we're going to do for the church and, and, and in the community and even in our missions projects, and we're going to talk about that tonight. And then we're going to take up an offering. I'm not going to convince you to give. I'm not going to beg you to give. I'm not going to trick you into giving. I'm not going to manipulate you into giving. Because God said in his word that he loves a cheerful giver. Don't give because you feel pressured. You give out of your gratitude towards God and for what he's done for you. You see, tithes and offerings is us giving back 10% of what God already gave. But if we learn to get a hold of the first fruits offerings, then, then you'll be surprised at what it will do in your life. We're going to have some people give testimonies tonight about how that they gave in a first fruits offering and what God has done and how they gave special offerings that God laid on their heart to give and what God has done. And if those people and you say, hey, I have a testimony I'd like to share, then you meet right back there in that corner after church because we're going to do a little video of you giving your testimony. But what does first fruits offering mean to us today? You see, first fruits offerings, let, let me kind of give you a history of it. First fruits, the Bible, in the Bible, 31 times the Bible talks about first fruits. 31 times. In many of those places, it talks about giving your first fruits as part of your tithes and then of your offerings. And so when it's talking about the offerings, you see in the Old Testament, there were four feasts that they had in the Old Testament where a first fruits offering was required. Are, are you listening to me? It wasn't suggested. It wasn't asked for. It was required. And that was Pentecost, tabernacles, and the first fruits or, or, or party, you might say. And so there were four different times that it was, it was given. And, and, and each time the Bible talks about how that as they gave at that time, that specific time, that it created a relationship with God to where that God actually poured out his blessings in a different manner, even more than what they could have expected before. And so it's very important that we understand a, a first fruits offering is that we get that out of gratitude for what God has done for us with an expectation of what God is going to do for us. Make sense? So, you see, first fruits offering, um, it, it's different from a tithe. The tithe is 10%, we know that. But first fruits offering is... Uh, 
you know, the scripture says this, with the same measure that you give is the same measure that it'll be given back to you. You know, so if you here tonight and you give, you know, you give $5 or $10 or $100,000 or a million dollars or five, 27 million, 180 million or 460 million, I can stop whenever y'all want me to. But as you give, the same measure that you give is the same to be given back to you. Okay? And so that's why I want to encourage you that when you give a first fruits offering is that you really pray about it. You ask God, you seek the Lord, and then you give what lays on your heart. Sometimes, you know, we, we, I know with Rhonda and I, a couple of years ago, God spoke a number and I was like, that ain't right. <laughs> Back in here. And then when I said, Ron, I feel like this is what God told me. The exact number that he told me. And, and we saw more blessings that year than we'd ever seen in our life before. Because we were obedient to do what God had instructed us to do. And so, why? Why? Why do we do it? And, and, um, and what does it mean to us today? Number one, it acknowledges God's ownership of all that we own. Everything that you if you haven't figured that out yet, you're in trouble, okay? You own, because if you think you can own it, or if you think that you did it on your own and by yourself, I promise you, you will lose it the same way. The second thing is this. A first fruits offering is given as a deposit guaranteeing God's blessing where we give. I've given first fruits offerings because I knew I was going to buy a house. And I said, God, this is how I And I gave a first fruits offering on that. And God blessed me with it. I've given first fruits offering because I needed a raise at work. And I gave a first fruit offering of what that raise needed to be, and God did it. It's our faith in him to know that he's going to bless us as we're obedient in doing this. So, how do you know what to give? You just ask God. You ask him. The scripture says this, and I'm closing with this in Psalms 89, 34. My covenant I will not break. Are you hearing me? Amen. Nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. God said he won't break his covenant. If he made you a promise, he'll keep it. If God said it in his word, it's real. It's the truth. You can take it to the bank. Ha, ha. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 through 10. So let each of us give as he promises in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always have all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance of every good work. He is dispersed abroad. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. And may he who supplies seed poor and bread and food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. It's very, very important that you listen to God in this. What God's telling you to do. Listen to me. For all the projects that we have this next year, we need about $100,000. And we're not. And, and, and here's what I'm going to tell you. My God will provide. He will. He always has. And so here's the opportunity that not just you, but all of us, including me and Rhonda, have. Here's what I want you to know. You say, Pastor, we don't have any money to give. You come have a meal with us, see what our vision is, where we're headed this next year fellowship with one another, get to know people you never met before, 
and have a great time. And we're going to celebrate the blessings of God. And as we celebrate it, listen to me. We will stand in front of you and we'll say, look what God's done. Look around you, folks. Look what God has done. Look what he's done. I didn't pay for this. God did. Look what he's done. So be a part of that tonight. I love you guys. God bless.